Hey, today we're talking about building a strategy that leads toward church cultural modification. You know, a strong church culture is an advantage any day. A culture of multiplication is going to serve to fulfill your corner of the Great Commission as it naturally leads to your own Jerusalem, your own Judea, your own Samaria, and into the rest of the earth. Cultural transformation is going to help you strengthen your organizational and family church identity. It brings a new future to life. The key here is to inspire your members and your leaders to live out your values, the values that you believe in, the values that you teach. And your culture only produces its really best results when people fully understand it and know their unique role in it. And so that's what we're talking about today. The goal here is to align what your core team decides are your base values, your church multiplication values, with the behaviors of the people in your community. You know, we spent a lot of time kind of assessing your current culture, which is, again, perfectly suited to the results that you currently enjoy. Now it's time that we start to bridge the gap between what you know and what you've experienced in the past, what your people are comfortable with, and what's going to make them probably a little less comfortable as we move toward the future. So as we build a strategy to modify your church culture, we're going to use the tools that we've previously presented in, in this module to do five different things. First, to define and to distinguish your church multiplication culture. We're going to actually have to look at the old culture as we look at the new culture, and we're going to kind of compare the two and see where they go. We want to think about communicating your culture on two levels, a congregational level and a leadership net level. We need to think about how to introduce change that moves people toward cultural adoption. This is a very big one. We need to learn to publicly praise God for the early victories that you enjoy, and then to sustain your gains by adjusting your structure and your system. This is the whole future, to adjust your structure and your systems toward future opportunities and future challenges. And the opportunities will begin to show themselves. As you begin to modify culture and you make the changes that are necessary, God's going to bless it and he's going to bless you in it. And so our, our whole goal here is to draw people together around the basic call of the Great Commission, the call that starts with Jesus walking by the shores of the Lake of Galilee and saying, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Uh, the call that calls us to make disciples and teach them to obey everything that Jesus commands, including love God, love your neighbor, and make disciples. And this thing just cycles on and on. If we're teaching them to obey his commands, we're teaching them to obey God, love their neighbor, and make disciples who love God, love their neighbor, and, and make disciples. And so we want to kind of draw everybody together around this. We want to focus on your particular part of this, your the things that make you unique as a leader, the things that you, make your church unique, the gifts, the abilities, the resources you have available, the community, the stuff that goes on in the community. And so let's just kind of talk about these five stages. Stage one is to define and distinguish your church multiplication culture. You know, culture is unique to every church, uh, but there's some basics here. The values, the vision, and a mission are all particularly written out really well in scripture. Now, your mission begins to be unique depending upon your neighborhood, your locale, your gifts, and all of that. But uh, all of this is rooted in the absolutes of scripture. And, and so as we look at this, we want to talk about the internal and the external variables you'll want to talk about. This isn't me. I'm, I'm presenting this lesson. I'm going, we're going to want to talk about this, and we're going to talk, want to talk about that. This is all about you. And you're going to want to talk about these things, the, the, your values, your vision, your particular mission, your purpose as it's rooted in Scripture and as it works its way out in your very, very, very unique uh, congregation. And so in the past sessions, I just want to remind you, you know, we looked at the McKinsey 7S diagram and then I kind of turned that thing into a value-based ladder that works its way into what a church multiplication culture could look at. Um, we have looked at scriptures that would found 
uh, pillars underneath our new spiritual house as a church as we begin to be a multiplication-based church. And then uh, we, we weighed cost versus opportunities. And again, these are all things that are going to be unique to you and things that you're going to have to communicate to your congregation in ways that make sense to them, ways that they want to adopt, and ways that they fully understand so that they can adopt the behaviors that go along with them. Secondly, we want to think about uh, communicating your church multiplication culture on two levels. And, you know, I said this over and I'll say it again. This begins in the pulpit. You, the, you get to talk to the most people most of the time, most efficiently when you're talking over the pulpit. And uh, if, if, if you're like a lot of the churches today, you know, we're there to bless people, we're there to entertain people, we're there to do everything possible but equip people. And you're going to have to make some shifts here to where you see yourself as an equipper of those saints to do the work of ministry, not in the church, not as a bunch of healthy, happy volunteers. That's got to happen too. But we've got to begin to move out into the neighborhood, into the community, into the business community, and, and, and motivate our people to become everyday missionaries everywhere they go. And this has to start with the pulpit. In fact, the leadership stuff that I want to talk to you about in just a second, which is more effective. See, pulpit is efficient. Talk to a lot of people you know, at one time, very simple. Leadership training becomes more efficient. You're making disciples who are making disciples who are making disciples. Your closest disciples, your core group. Your seven fanatics, you know, I've always felt like my primary purpose as a pastor was to disciple my church staff. And, you know, when I was in a big church, I was like 25 people. But I always had my little group of seven on the side. And these are the people who just buy in into what we're doing. And this is kind of the cutting edge of everything. And, of course, I'm spending a lot of time with whoever's about ready to go out the door as a church punter. But I want to talk to you about two levels here. Congregational level, very, very efficient. A lot of people all the time you get to put into them. You get to put a lot of material out and you can print notes and you can put it on the internet and you can do all these things to drive it a little bit deeper. But leadership, you take the, the where you're at as a congregation and now you begin to focus on leaders and you start to bring books into it and stuff like this. You know, if I was a pastor who was going through this module, I would be taking all the materials in the module and teaching those things to the people in my church. I'd be looking at books. I'm, I'm promoting a book here. My book, Let Go of the Ring. It's the history of a church multiplication culture developing from a church that wasn't doing it to a church that was doing it very effectively. Um, I, I start to, to find tools that would help me to train the leaders to do the, the thing that we most want, uh, Im importantly want to do, and that's make disciples who multiply churches. And so we're talking about efficiency in the pulpit and effectiveness in disciple making and leadership training. And then the third thing here is to introduce change that moves people toward cultural adoption. And, you know, we've said this before, but again, narratives introduce vocabulary. I'm telling a story, a new word pops out. You know, I was doing a webcast with some people earlier today, and I was talking about how David used a sling as a force multiplier as he went against Goliath. You know, Goliath comes at him with spear and shield and sword and helmet and armor and all this, and David comes with a bag of rocks and a leather sling. And Goliath mocks him because he thinks he's going to throw the rocks at him. You know, that's not going to do anything. But David gave Goliath a lesson in ballistics before he cut his head off. He used the sling as a force multiplier. And as we get into this, we, we want to start to change behaviors. We want people not to come to church to have a good time. We want them to come to church to learn something. We want people to not begin to, 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 to begin to think of their small groups and whatever, not as a fellowship group, but as a disciple-making group. And so as, as narratives begin to introduce vocabulary, vocabulary then shapes behavior. You know, you say fellowship or you say disciple-making. Vastly different concepts come out of this. And so you need to learn the value of storytelling from Jesus. 
Uh, I think it's really, really crucially important here that uh, every sermon that you that you bring or every teaching that you bring across the pulpit starts with a story. And best if it can start with a story out of somebody doing something well in your congregation, something of what you've been teaching them, and you begin to make heroes out of the people that are there. Uh, personal stories are the best. You know, you had some experience with your neighbor this week. You got to pray with somebody. Tell those stories. After that, you want stories from your members. Uh, tell the family stories of the congregation and tell them over and over again. If you've got these epic stories from even the recent past or the deep past, tell those stories. Uh, begin to make heroes out of people. But uh, f finally, um, you know, maybe stories from other churches. You read a book and you get up and you tell the story. But be honest about that. You know, I heard a pastor once get up and tell a story about how he had shared the Lord with the Buddhist priest and the Buddhist priest said, you know, all these things that happened and the guy became a Christian and everything. And just by chance, I went home, I was reading a book and I found that story in the book that I was reading. It wasn't his story at all. He had basically lied to people by making his story. Be honest with this kind of stuff. But ab above all, as, as you're doing this, uh, begin to think about where's God come into the mix of this. Now, as we're at this point of where we're talking about introducing change that moves people toward cultural adoption, one tool that I found very effective, and I've given you this uh, in the ancillary tools that we provide uh, in, along with the coaching, and that's called SWOT analysis. SWOT means strength, weakness, opportunity, and threats. Strength and weakness basically are internal. You're, you're, you're strong here. You're weak over there. Opportunities and threats are usually external. Even in the COVID epidemic, there's opportunities. There's threats there, to be sure, but there's opportunities that come along with it. And so uh, one, one of the things that I would do at this point where I'm thinking of introducing change into the life of the congregation is gather as many people as you're comfortable with, you know, all the leaders in the church or all the leaders in the church plus all the people who are interested in attending. And, and I would use the, the PowerPoint that I've included with this to help you teach about SWAT. And then I would use the PDFs that I've included with this session to uh, actually work with people to develop SWAT. And the way that I would do this is I would take everybody through 15 minutes of this is how SWAT works using the PowerPoint. And then I would distribute the PDFs and I'd ask people to go through the exercise and then I, I would, in small groups, like four or five at the most, and then at, I, I would pull everybody together and, and start to ask for, you know, the top three strengths that you can identify, the top three weaknesses that are there, the top three uh, opportunities that you can identify, or maybe five or seven opportunities, because usually they do abound, and then the weaknesses. And, you know, the paper that I put out, the PDF, is going to be pretty self-explanatory. My point is that you get a lot of people gathered together around the concept of a multiplication culture. And now here becomes the steps that we have to take to get there. The more people that you can get to this meeting, the more people that are going to have bought into what you're trying to do, and the more people are going to become your little agents in the congregation to help you to try to get to where you have to get to. I've done this numerous times. About every four or five years, I take people through a SWOT analysis, and it's been very, very helpful to us uh, to, to do the thing that we're going to probably talk about in the next session, and that is to introduce change without breaking wineskins. I want you to think about publicly praising God for early victories. This may sound a little bit redundant because just in point three, I was talking about making heroes out of people and telling a lot of stories, but you need to make heroes out of your your members, <clears throat> but God needs to be the ultimate hero in every story. Talk to your people about the things that God is doing in the lives of your people. And then as you do, uh, and you remember that the Lord deserves the glory for all that's going on in your church because it's his church after all. Uh, a thing that I've noticed is that a move toward multiplication is nearly always rewarded by the Lord uh, with material blessings from heaven. It might be financial blessings. It might be relational blessings. It might actually be a group of people who decide that they want to join your church because you guys are going someplace. Uh, it, in, in some situations, it's been donated lands and donated buildings Experience shows me that God is going to bless you 
as you step into this process of building a culture of multiplication into your church. And as, as you do this, uh, you really need to un expect good things to happen uh, for a community to fully embrace you as a church. I mean, in this day and age, that's a kind of a rare thing, but it happened. It happened to us. Um, we, we were in league with the police department. We were in league with the public schools. The newspapers loved us. I mean, some incredible things happened to us while I was pastoring in Kaneohe. Those kind of things can happen to you, but you got to remember those are God events, and you got to give the glory where it's due if you want to keep the blessings flowing. And so uh, David called us to magnify the Lord. You know, how do you magnify someone who won't allow themselves to be seen? You know, the invisible God, how do you magnify the Lord? Well, you do so by focusing people's attention on the Lord as the blesser in their life and the blesser in the life of their church. And then the fifth point here is that you would sustain your gains by adjusting your structure and your systems. Structure and systems are the two impediments to change. I mean, this is the way we've always done it. We don't want to upset the apple cart. You know, you hear these kinds of things. And if, if we're going to really sustain any gains in momentum that we get by changing the way people think, we got to change the way that they act, but not just the way that they act for the moment, the way that they're going to act in the long term. And that what's going to govern that, whether it works or not, is going to be what you do in the systems that you build into your church and into the structures that you build into your church. Now, I, I just to be honest, moving toward a culture of church multiplication is going to be disruptive. There are going to be some people who are upset because that is the way we always did it. And you're going to have to figure out how to mollify those people. But the truth is you're going to have to make these changes. And it's going to take some courage on your part if you're going to, to make the changes. You know, I was reading recently in the book of Ruth. I've been kind of working through the Old Testament in my de devotions. And I started thinking about the people of courage in the book of Ruth. You know, we always think of, of Ruth and loyalty. But think about this. Naomi could have stayed in Moab and just lived off of her daughters-in-law. She could have put them both to work. And she kind of could have cruised off into the sunset. It took courage for her to go back to Israel and start all over. It took courage for Ruth to go along with her. It took courage for Ruth to go into a field where we know there was at least sexual harassment because Boaz had to warn the young guys off of this girl. Uh, and, and, and then get to Boaz himself. He falls in love with Ruth. He wants to marry her. But custom demands that he offers the opportunity to his cousin first. And he goes ahead and does that. Anything good that you're going to do in serving the Lord and in walking after him is going to take some courage. And this means that if you're really going to introduce a lasting, you know, not a passing, not a, that was the fad of the moment deal, but a church multiplication culture to your church that endures for, you know, beyond you, then you're going to have to deal with uh, structure and you're going to have to deal with systems and and, and then how, how you figure out how to navigate through the challenges and the opportunities that are there. For my sake, in my situation, we kind of always looked at every major decision that we made as a precedent center for the future. And we would uh, look back through our church council, we had a board, and we would always, staff would, you know, staff was running the church, but the board was overseeing us. And so we would go to the board every year and go, here's some changes that we've made this year. And, and here's the ones that we think are significant enough that they go into the policy manual. And so we would modify the church policy manual, which kind of put me in a position of somebody comes to me, they're all upset about something. They don't want to do it this way. They want to do it that way. And I go, well, you know, the board decided and we have it written here in the policy manual. I could take you there and show you. Now, I seldom ever had to take anybody there and show them. But the fact that we had written it down, the fact that it had become part of our church secondary Bible, if you would, the policy manual, uh, 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 allowed me to have a certain kind of authority into helping guide people. And usually they, they would acquiesce to that. You know, it was just a, um, a, a pretty amazing thing. And so it's here that long-term goals should in, influence your short-term decisions. You know, we've talked before about this. And again, I just want to bring it up. You need to have a 20-year plan. You know, you don't know where you're going to be in 20 years. Nobody can. But you do know aspirationally 
where you want to be. Now think about this, an aspirational goal or a practical goal. My 20 year goals are aspirational. I'm 75 years old as I'm talking to you. I live in a lovely house. I moved from Hawaii where we always have small houses to California where houses are a lot less expensive. I just, I love where I live. I want to live here when I'm 95. I want to be married to the same woman when I'm 95. I want to be alive when I'm 95. I want to be doing something like this when I'm 95. You know, I may be old and crotchety, but I hope that I'm doing something to contribute to the kingdom of God when I'm 95. Those are all aspirational goals. And it's pretty easy for me to figure out where I'd like to be in 25 years. It's very, very difficult for me to think of a five-year plan or a 10-year plan. And I'm really good at popping out one-year plans that each one is a variant from last year. Even if I'm one of those people who, who takes the budget of last year and tries to bud, build a budget this year, I'm going to be the product of the latest book that I read, and we're going to ping pong, we're going to bounce all over the place. But if I've got the 20-year aspirational plan as, as a North Star to help me to navigate, then I'm going to be able to align my 10-year goals to my 20-year goals, and my five-year goals to my 10-year goals, and then one, two, three, four, five, I can begin to look five years out. And, and, and the important thing here, again, we're talking about a culture of multiplication. We're not talking about a strategic plan for next year here. We're talking about a strategic plan for implementing a culture. I can begin to go, this is what we're gonna do in year one, this is what we're gonna do in year two, this is what we're gonna do in year three, and so on. And, and I, can, I can really make the shift to a, a, a new and different culture without upsetting a lot of people, without losing a lot of people, and all the meantime, uh, just taking advantage of every opportunity that the Lord drops in our lap.